All right. Hi, everybody. We're live. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Wayne A. Gilbert. How you doing, Wayne? Good morning. Good um, morning. I'm hanging in. I'm hanging in there. Hanging in. You? You've had some, you've had some uh, serious uh, illness. Not, not great, right? COVID yeah, and then just hanging on. We're figuring it out slowly but surely. Yeah. Yes. There's nothing well, I'm glad I'm glad we made it here today. Me too. Me too. Um, I know most of our, a lot of our community knows who you are, but um, I hope that a lot of people watching this who don't know who you are. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, you know, your career and your work? You've had such um, an interesting profession and career. Okay. So we'd love to hear about that. Sure. I mean, I'm, uh, I spent my work life pretty much as a teacher, first high school, then I was full-time at a local community college for uh, much of my career. And most of that time, I was also an adjunct uh, in educational psychology at the University of Colorado, Denver. I was full-time in English. And uh, I retired a few years ago, now 10 or 11, gosh, I don't know. Long enough that I'm really used to it now, and I cannot imagine going back to work um, at all. Although I loved it very much, um, I'm, I'm I'm really glad to be retired because it's given me the opportunity to to be more of a poet and less of a teacher. Teaching teaching took a lot of the a lot of the energy and inner resources required to to write. At least in, in my life, I know others managed to do it, but so being freer now to um, to pursue poems is is really cool. Did, I uh, um, did you retire uh, because of Parkinson's, or did you just retire yes. because it was time to retire? Okay, one, what, can you talk a little bit about what your diagnosis process was like? Sure, I was I was diagnosed. Um, I was diagnosed. That's always the first thing we say, isn't it? Hi, I'm Wayne. I was diagnosed in 2005, um, just a couple of months before my 55th birthday, and. Uh, um, the first thing I did was go home and write a poem about that experience of being diagnosed. And, uh, yeah, I worked, I worked a little bit longer, a few more years and until 2012, I think it was, uh -huh. and, but it got harder and harder because at the community college, a full-time teacher teaches five courses and, and I was still teaching at the university as well. And, it just it just became too much. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. So um, I managed to figure out a way. Um, actually, my wife managed to figure out a way that I could retire then, and I really needed to do that. Yeah, I wasn't ready um, to to do that. It wasn't part of the plan. But um, plan. <laughs> One of the things I've learned from from Parkinson's and old age is that. Um, plans are usually worth the paper they're written on, and um, that's about it. All right. Hi, Audrey. Great to see you here today. She says, hi, Wayne and Mel. Good to see you. Um, so when you got that diagnosis and went home and wrote a poem, was was doing that act something you had done your whole life when you had to deal with something big, like that's how you processed it? Or was this sort of a new I need to write a poem. <clears throat> it was not a new at all. I mean, I'm, I'm probably, probably our audience noticed I'm a white man. And that means that I grew up in a culture where um, there were two feelings for men. One was none and the other was anger. So growing up, I had no clue how to differentiate uh, amongst feelings. I didn't know what they were, how to label them, what to do with them, other than um, stifle them, stuff them. So as a senior in high school, actually, I, I, I accidentally discovered writing as a way to, to express feelings. And then I discovered, oh my gosh, they're different from one another. I can begin to differentiate amongst them. And that year, you know, I was, I was at my third high school. My father was in Vietnam. Uh, my mother and sister and brother and I moved to this teeny tiny little town in Iowa after having moved 16 times before that. So it was a rough time. And 
there was a lot of, and it was the Vietnam era. I turned 18 and registered for the draft. All this was going on inside. And, and the way I learned to process things was to write. Usually journal, I kept a journal. I started a journal in 1969 and have, have kept it up. My daughter won't let me throw them away. That is, uh, that is good. I, um, I, I went, I, I was a big journaler, but I just went through a phase where I said, oh no, if anybody ever reads these, I'm going to be, I just am not, and it's not okay. I, and I remember just telling the story. I, I remember I, I filled a black garbage bag with them and I went to this dumpster and I remember looking around like, like I was dumping a body or something, you know, mm -hmm. like I just was like, what are, what are people thinking I'm doing? I, I dumped it in there and I, it was, it was a crazy feeling. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just, there's so much there, right? But there's so much there. And I, but then I went back to it. I don't know. It's an interesting practice, right? It is. And, and for me, it's essential. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I literally um, cannot imagine. It is the most important medicine in my life and has been my entire, uh, since, since 1969. I, I simply can't imagine um, sorting through my own feelings and discovering new meanings when that's required without, right. without writing. I know that's not everybody's thing, um, but for me, that is absolutely an essential part of my life. Essential. If yeah. I couldn't write, I would have to figure out a way to use recording or something. I, I don't know what I would do. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I've ever, yeah, no, nothing has, I've never worked through anything without writing through it. Right. Um, Everyone says, uh, Susan says, hi, Wayne. Hello, Mel. Hi, w Ron says, hi, Wayne. You look great as always. I hope I look as good as you in old age. Uh, hi, Elizabeth Holler from New York, <coughs> NYC. <clears throat> it's great to see everybody here. Um, okay, so do, do you remember the name of that poem that you wrote right after your diagnosis? I do. Actually, it's re it's recorded and it's on the website. Uh, it's called Toxic Psalm. Yes. Um, I've, I've read it over the years since over the 18 years now, almost 18 years since my diagnosis, off and on, because it really shows, that poem shows how I was really struggling to find some new metaphors I could use that would express this whole new situation I was in that, that I didn't understand in any way, shape or form. I didn't understand what it would mean for the rest of my life. I didn't understand what it would mean for my teaching. I didn't understand what it would mean for my relationship with my wife. I didn't know what the hell was happening to me. Um, that is one of the most important questions we ask, I think as humans, but certainly as uh, in, this, in this crazy ride of Parkinson's, these things just constantly are happening to us and it's hard to know what they are, um, much less what they mean. And then what, the, what, what do we do with them? Um, so poems, writing, and it, particularly poems, usually end up, if not showing me a way or the way, at least um, giving me the opportunity to uh, sort of be here now with a kind of clarity. Um, yeah. I think um, a lot of, excuse me one second. Mm hmm I totally um, understand. Yes. Um, a lot of people, you know, have sort of different experiences when they were first diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it takes them, you know, kind of bury their head for a while. For some mm -hmm. people, they jump right in. What was your experience like? Well, I was a, I was a, I was a like, no way. That's ridiculous for, for a couple, three months. And I required a second opinion. Um, and the second opinion was like, okay, fine. And then I was like, go online, go, go to the library, read everything I can possibly learn everything I possibly can about it. But I was not a joiner. I went to a couple of, of support groups early on, my wife and I, and came away like, this is a bunch of old people. Like, um, <clears throat> and no offense to old people, cause I'd be one now. Um, but it wasn't like, and it was all, it was all, all the programs were all sort of, here's another medical expert telling you some medical information that had nothing whatsoever to do with answering that question, what's happening to me? What does it mean? What do I do about it? 
So I didn't get connected really to the community at large um, for a long time. And if I, if I could do it over, I think I, I would have broadened my search to include ways to, to connect with the community. Um, and I found, yeah. my, I found my way in eventually. And, and that too has been a real uh, vital, that's part of my support. My, uh, my care team is, is the larger community for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> well, so that, that's an interesting thing that a lot of people go through in terms of um, they get a diagnosis, they're younger and all the literature, all it's just old white men stooped over and feeling old. And yes, what could, you know, what could, a, what could, where did you, first of all, you went online, you started looking for things, but I'm wondering like, what could some, what could have happened in your community to show you there are other groups, there are groups of people that are more like you. What, what could we have done? Because I think that that's a big issue. That is a big issue that we face no. um, as we get out into the world and want to help build health sure. in Parkinson's communities. Gosh, you know, I, I don't, I really don't know. I, I think 18 years ago, there, there wasn't much. Um, uh, it was much harder to find. It's so much, there are so many more organizations now, um, <clears throat> Davis Finney Foundation, um, <clears throat> for instance, excuse me, the Brian Grant Foundation is, a, is another one and that focuses on, you know, living, not on some esoteric research of pharmaceuticals and promises of cures and all that um, hocus pocus. Um, and so I don't know, I really don't know why um, I co-founded a, with my sister and niece, um, I co-founded a dance program that's affiliated with Dance for PD. It's not the same as Dances for PD. And, and we did that 11 and a half years ago. And that became a little support group for those of us who got involved in dance. And that was really important to have that kind of activity. Um, but I think there's such a huge difference between there's my dance teacher yep. and my niece just said, love you. Wayne. Yep. I, just, I threw it up there. I was like, Oh, this is good. Yeah, love you back. Um, for sure. And, and the, um, <clears throat> to make, I think the Parkinson's community has gotten much more, um, <clears throat> excuse me, much more sophisticated differentiating between early onset and, um, excuse me, just one minute. Between early onset and what I call geezer onset, um, they're they're hugely different. You know, um, even at, even at age fifty five, that was you know I'd lived a life, I'd had a career, my family was raised, uh, um, so to speak, um, if that's what you do with them. And um, it's that's so different from somebody in their twenties, thirties, or forties who who have looked forward to this much longer life. So, you know, as I become an old, um, an old man, I, I, I have so much to look back on and be grateful for um, in such a different way. You know, my children knew me without Parkinson's disease, for instance, and some of my good friends with uh, um, young onset, um, that will not happen. Now, you know, my kids grew up with a, with a mom who has an artificial leg and, and that was not weird to them. So, because that's what they knew. And of course there's that, but, but developmentally, I think in terms of our life stages and what the, what the crucial issues are in our life stages are just so, so different. There are many similarities. Um, and I'm so grateful for so many of the connections to my friends with young onset for that very reason. Um, yeah. That, yeah. So I think that's one thing the community, including DPF, has become much more sophisticated and intentional about is addressing these completely different needs. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Uh, it is such an important question. What, how to found your community. <laughs> it does require so much thought and consideration and listening and um, hearing what people need. Uh, so you talk about your kids. What was um, how old were your kids when you were diagnosed, and how was that communication? You're going to ask me to do math. Okay, general um, decade. 
teens, they were good. middle they school, were, high school. <laughs> they were they were they were out of high school. Oh, okay. So they were young adults, and and uh, you know, I, I it it didn't seem like that big a deal because um, I've been really, I've been really. Um, I mean, what, whatever a Parkinson's, my Parkinson's doesn't show as much as everybody else's or as, lot, as much as a lot of others, not everybody um, by any means. But so it was a little easier. De denial is just so damn important. And, and some things make it easier than, um, than other uh, ways of being, so to speak. Um, so I, I know it's, I think it's gotten harder for them as, but then, you know, the, the whole aging, aging parent thing is, is uh, kind of begins, sometimes it's hard to, to distinguish the issues of aging and, and Parkinson's. They are just so intertwined and, and play off of one another um, in, a, in a way that, you know, it's just impossible to, to play a violin or a guitar without all the strings and and it requires them all and while you can distinguish them in a way it takes the the music that they play um i don't know that's not a very good metaphor but uh you know what i mean yeah. I, think, I hope yeah so if you don't know what i mean and you're in the audience please feel free to yeah. ask, me, ask what the hell i'm talking about oh, in the yeah. chat <laughs> um and connie says looking good wayne as ever and as, as ever so thoughtful thank you oh uh, yeah um so quite you you said mine doesn't show up as as much as other people. Can you share a little bit about your what what are your sort of cardinal symptoms that have really impacted your quality of life and and how has that changed over the last oh my god many well, many years almost twenty yeah. years. I'm I'm right I'm I would say I'm right in the middle of a major transition right now, and and I guess mine have included more pain a lot of pain. Stiffness and rigidity, um, uh, and depression and anxiety, um, cog some cognitive issues. I, I had to stop driving because I, I just began to feel overwhelmed by the amount of sensory stimuli coming in, and my my brain my brain was just like, dude, I can't handle all this. Slow down. Well, that's not a good thing to be saying on the on uh, the turnpike between Boulder and Denver, you know, um, or on I-25 or any of the other, or even on Colfax Avenue. It, and so I just had to decide to quit. And that has complications and implications that are pretty far reaching as well. Um, but you know, there's, so um, yeah, I, I did, I, I've never really had a tremor um, what, sometimes it, it shows up and sometimes I have internal tremors, but you know, nobody can see that's what every people often say, God, when you look so good. Well, I always add, you know, yeah. Okay. For a septuagenarian and all that stuff, but, but you don't get to see that you can't see the inside. That's another thing. Reason I love poetry is that I, I feel like I can reveal, if you will, who, who I really am, what's really happening in ways that just being in the world or being seen um, uh, doesn't do. Um, and I, one of the things I've, I've noticed, well, this is partly my training in developmental psychology as well, that I think there's such a big difference between what, when you and Jan Grimes talked earlier, um, last week, I think it was, um, the word adjustment, making adjustments came up. And I was thinking, that's a good word because, but it's different from transition. You know, as we go along, we learn to make little adjustments, even if our bodies and, uh, um, okay, I have to slow down a little bit here to uh, catch my breath. No worries, no worries, take your time. Um, <clears throat> Adjustments are all those little improvisations and, and ways we're flexible day to day. But um, the adjustments don't require a change in the big overstory, the arching, the narrative arc 
of our life. We have a certain way we understand Parkinson's and a certain way we understand who we are, and that remains fairly steady. But at some point along the line, um, something happens, either inwardly or outwardly or both, that shatters that overarching narrative arc. I can't, and I can't ignore it. However hard I will try, because I want to live by that story, and I only want to make adjustments. But now, now something has happened that requires a major transition. And in some way, I am going to be different when this transition is more or less, when it's gone past the midline, if you will. I don't believe it's ever over, but, um, and life will be different in ways I don't really understand right now. The pandemic began for me in as that kind of event. Um, I loved it in a way because it gave me a solitude I've, I've always longed for my whole life and, and I got it. But wow, careful what you ask for, you know, that was rough. And so when these, when, when these internal or external or co combined changes occur, you have to one, you have to examine everything your life is built on. And because things that were working before aren't working anymore. It's, it's and it's terrifying. It's also really exciting, but it's mostly terrifying. Yeah. Um, and this storm moves in and, and you're in the middle of a storm. Um, puberty was that way, um, to choose an example that everybody has been through. Um, my wife went through something like this for years and years. She had an artificial leg that was covered. So it was very difficult for people to notice that she had an artificial leg. Someone might notice that she had a little tiny bit of a limp. Um, so she was in control of when that was revealed. Well, a few years ago, she wasn't able any longer to have a cover over her prosthetic, her prosthesis. And it was traumatic because now everybody could see instantly. And I can remember uh, noticing um, people all around us as we would walk along somewhere um, would look, <laughs> we're always looking. And, and when, when she was younger, I used to notice when, when we were first going out together, I used to notice that too, because, um, cause people were envying that I was with this beautiful young woman and because she was very attractive. So people would watch her go by, you know, and this was now people are watching her go by, but they, they were like, mm -hmm. and she lost control of that. Oh yeah. Uh, of, of the reveal, if you will. And that was that was a fair, that was one of those moments where where everything shifted. Yeah, that's a big one. What are some of the things that you're trying to do as you go through this real transition right now? Well, um, the this poem, "The River," is my answer to that question. So I'm going to sneak it right in here, just like we, just like we planned it. Just like we planned it. I want to. I'm going to hold. I'm going to put it up. Hang on a second. Okay. Mel. Yeah. Can you see it? Yeah, but that's that's not this poem. That. That's for, an, that's for another poem. Oh, poem. okay. So then we don't need this one right now. Correct. Okay. Thanks. This is called The River. Number one, a river is a body made mostly of water. Between two banks, inevitably moves irresistibly one way. Two, little boat tied up. Beside the river, I sit under a giant tree, its lifetimes looming larger than my 70-some years. 
I now leaning back, loafing, hoping my strength will return enough to push off again soon after I recover, before all three of us are drought dust. Number three, I've recently been to the source of the river Colorado. Not much to see other than swampy wetlands, eventually heading down the canyon it once eons ago carved from solid rock. I could see how beautiful it must have been before fossil fuels, toxic chemistry. Rafters float slowly now. In spring, by summer, you can almost walk across. Four, I've lived close to rivers enough to use a lot of bridges, but I never swam nor fished, sat on a dock waiting for my turn in the speedboat. I've seen the aftermath of some hundred year floods. Not one touched me personally, no losses, no reverberations, no John the Baptist. I used maps to study the shape and flow of rivers, how they divide states, provide commercial transportation, feed each other enough to construct great Delta marshlands. I sat in the back seat while my daddy drove cross country so many times I lost count. I poured over the circulatory system of this great land. Number five. I wrote number five for my DPF ambassador poets. I don't miss my life at all right now. I don't even have to look at my calendar. There's nothing I can do today anyway with positive COVID tests. This too shall pass, right? I've tried everything to stop this coughing, keep from catastrophizing. I'm the dying river. Among the eddies along the bank, sunlight splashes, each flash the face of a friend I've never met, though we know each other well. They understand, I am afraid, I will not fully recover. I'm comforted. Six, for Matt. My knowledge of river is like my knowledge of God, learned from scholars' tomes. It's hard to write authentically about a place you've never been, experienced, never experienced firsthand. I often discuss this problem with my incarcerated friend who must call me if we are to communicate. I cannot call him. I've read Kafka, Camus, I've a lifetime of melancholia, living in a society always trying to break me down. I know all about prison life. Oh, bull. I don't know a goddamn thing about prison life. I wouldn't last a day. My friend gives me permission to use the correctional facility to which, in which he is a resident to call my diagnosis a conviction. And the rest of my days, a life sentence without the possibility of parole. My friend says, this is how we love each other. Although I need to be reminded, I believe him. Seven, I have some confidence claiming the riverbank the river itself, even this little boat, which I have never actually operated. The river, the river will bring all manner of things to me, take them all away. While I recover from the latest hard to manage currents, sooner or later, I'll return probably, but perhaps, I don't know, we'll see. I want to read a sequel to Huckleberry Finn about how he aged on the old muddy Mississippi. Meanwhile, the Colorado River no longer reaches the dead delta at its former mouth on the Gulf of California. Pretty much peters out before it crosses the border. Eight, my little boat floats, easy, perfectly low, shaped for the most, shaped for most, any water. A wooden sampan with a handmade rudder, a curved cover, just enough for one. It bumps now against the bank where I've secured it to the same tree against which I lean. 
I am certain it has a heartbeat. Perhaps it resonates with the cousin gives us both shade. Perhaps they're sharing arborescent mem memories. Either way, my craft is content to stay forever or to go whenever, which for now gives me some peace. Mm, thank you, Wayne. I love that. So many pieces uh, to pull out. I love the... Uh, I love the metaphor about the correctional facility. Uh, and I, I feel like it's a really good segue for you to talk a little bit about. Yeah, everyone says, wow, Wayne, thank you. Thank you. You got the diagnosis. You wrote the poem. You worked for a little while, and then you retired. And the amount of work you've done in the community since then is unbelievable. And the work you did in prisons and other locations, I'd love to hear about it. And I'd love to hear what brought you there and what you got out of it and what you love about it. Wow. Well, I got out of my work with prison. What I got out of my work of, with, in prisons was way beyond what I put into it, I'll tell you that. Um, two very, very close friends. Um, with whom I'm in contact every week by telephone and uh, um, at least once a week by telephone. Um, but I got a clearer sense of who's there in those places. Um, turns out they're men, human men, who made some stupid choices um, but are so much more than those choices they made. And uh, they taught me so much about learning and about growth and uh, resilience. And all those words we toss around out here in the world, so to speak, um, as if they're easy and, and they're not. I am not an optimist. I do not belong to the Michael J. Fox School of Optimism. Um, I flunked out. Um, and I'm not a positive person by nature in, in, all, in the popular ways that we use those words. Uh, I don't, I'm not even sure I'm a hopeful person, but, but I'm a learning person. And, and I, when you get, and what I, the men I met, and of course they're not all this way, but the men I met in prison, and many of the people, so many of the people I've met in the Parkinson's community share this quality of, okay, I've had this like awakening. It's that transition again, um, where, you know, solitary. I remember a man telling me uh, that he was in solitary f confinement for he figured the 16th year, not all at once, different times when he finally had a thought. Hmm. I keep doing the same thing and ending up in the same place. What's wrong with this picture? I think I have to do something about this. And so began uh, a learning process in which he was determined to kind of turn his life around. Does this mean he got out of prison early? No. Uh, it's pretty clear he's never going to, he's going to die in prison. Can you have a life in prison? You better bloody well believe you can. You can have a really meaningful life in prison. Um, and, and my two friends who, with whom I um, uh, have contact, regular contact, are doing just that. They're incredible leaders in new communities, doing work inside the prison to remake, trans, completely transform the prison. And this has transformed their lives. And now they're transforming other people's lives. And even if they never get out of prison, they, these, the men that, that, that they're working with in these communities will get out of prison and perhaps take something they learned from my friends with them. Well, I mean, what the, that's it. 
And I've seen that in the Parkinson's community as well. We're all different, of course. Um, and yet this is, this is the, the way we go. I have to say at the same time, now I feel right now, I don't know whether this is uh, the beginning of the transition or, or I'm nearing the end and my life is changing just over in ways that it will not, that I won't return to the way it was. I, I don't know for sure, but I, I suspect um, it is. Um, is that now I'm looking for, I'm looking for not more ways to be engaged actually, for, I'm looking for spaces where I can find uh, uh, peace, relief, refuge, sanctuary, where, and they're small spaces, even inner spaces, where, where things are not, where, where, uh, where the air is, is free and the, the, there's no Parkinson's or, or no pain and or no arthritis or no whatever um and man those places are hard to hard to find and and they're difficult to stay um but those are the those are the places i'm i'm uh taking i'm looking for now and and that's the the image of of the poet me in this case sitting on the sitting on beside the river as opposed to being on the river not to say that i won't ever be back on the river again i don't know but uh, i'm i'm not there now um so to to make a, a little connection you i I'm, i suspect that part of what you did for those men in prison was you created a sanctuary a place of peace and you're looking for that right now a little yes. bit more. What, what did that do for them? Like, how were they before this started? I know you said that these people are doing amazing things, but what, what was it of, about that sanctuary and about that uh, place, space, uh, that, that you gave them, that they were able to make a change? And then what is, what is happening for you in those moments when you are sitting by the river now, not fully engaged? Noisy. Yeah, I, I guess they used to say one of the things I heard regularly um, was that the cla the classroom space where we where we held the poetry workshops and they really weren't workshops in the classic MFA sense. They were they were they brought poems, they shared them, we talked about them, and and we went on to the next poem. But what they what they would say to me that this was the one. This was the one place in the world that was predictable to them. And I, that just like, what? And because ironically, the world of prison is not predictable at all. You have no, you have no control, first of all, over what's gonna happen. You cannot believe a thing anyone tells you, um, no matter their motives, it doesn't matter. And, the danger is real. Um, and that there are so many other men around, you just never know what's gonna happen, where they knew. So vulnerability is absolutely forbidden, taboo. You do not be vulnerable um, in any way, shape or form, physically, emotionally, or whatever. But in, in the poems and the poem, the classroom of poems, people could be vulnerable. The men could be vulnerable. We could talk about being men who were taught that emotions were not acceptable, except for anger. We could talk about men learning about violence. We could talk about men whose hearts were broken because of that, whose spirits were crushed because of that, who knew no other way but anger. And so it was a place to be vulnerable. And all I had to do was was kind of hold that space open and make sure that uh, vulnerability was always okay there. And then they had to take that out into the, live with that when they left the classroom because I couldn't do any, uh, 
anything about the rest of their world. Um, and I think there's a set, just as I'm hearing myself say that, I'm, I'm, there's part of me, there's part of me listening to that and saying, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's, that's, that's that space where you can just be. Um, um, I've been practicing uh, don't know mind a lot rather than what my wife calls trying to explain everything mind. Um, don't know mind has, has been um, really, really good company for me lately. I highly recommend don't know mind. Well, can you give um, our community an example of maybe something in the Parkinson space that comes your way and you're like, don't know mind? Sure. When there's, when you get a new, when we get a new symptom, it's not a new version of an old symptom. It's a symptom you might have heard about or even more difficult, a symptom like you had no idea had anything whatsoever to do with Parkinson's and it's a whopper. Um, that's a, that's a moment. And it's a moment for so many reasons. You have no idea. Again, I reach out to that question. What's happening to me now? What does it mean? And those two questions wake up trying to explain everything mind and trying to explain everything mind is making up all these stories. Oh my God, this is it. This is the big one. Um, I'm going to die for sure from this. This is it. Or I'm going like, I'm, you know, now, I'm, now I'm going to look like those old men I saw or whatever. And, and you just start fantasizing and catastrophizing and don't know mind just says, um, I don't know anything right now. What I know is I'm sitting here talking to Mel and I know there's some of my most beloved friends and family um, listening to us. And I'm thinking that's so wonderful. Um, and I, that's it, that's all I know. And that, and that, is, that helps me be here. Um, and we all know the so-called healthcare system um, yeah, it's three, four, five months out for to get tests done before you can even know what's going on with you, much less like, well, what are my options then? Well, well I don't know. We'll have to explore, blah, 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 blah. And two years later or whatever, okay, what do you, I just have to wait. And it's infuriating. It's intimidating. It's terrifying. Um, it literally takes my breath away. And then I'm like, I don't know any of that stuff. I don't know what's going on. I don't know. I just don't know. And that has to be okay. And that brings me to this, to the second poem in that painting. Um, to, can you put that up and I'll share the second poem. A lovely friend of mine with whom I've collaborated a number of times. Um, is a is an incredible artist, painter, visual art of all kinds. And um, she has a whole series of paintings she did on, uh, uh, well, now I can't think of the word I want. Anyway, virtually by herself in a little studio in Wyoming. And this was one she showed, uh, sent a photo of to show me. And this poem, relates to this painting, very much so. And the poem is called Acceptance. After a painting by Sue Gibbons called An Approaching Storm. Behold, the storm of the Lord has gone forth in fury. Jeremiah 23, 10a. Number one, first there was a warning of imminent danger Extreme weather conditions forecast thunderheads churning on the horizon, a tsunami of darkness surging towards me. I took cover, sought shelter like the others in corridors and basements, waited anxiously for the waves to crash upon my head. Two, soon enough, the storm came and went as storms always do, each with its own consequences, sometimes wondrous, sometimes catastrophic. 
usually a host of minor inconveniences. I stood afterward measuring the landscape first for damages, then for benefits I might accrue, but I was scanning the wrong places. Something, something inside me, unmeasurable, had turned. The way houseplants pivot slowly from the room toward the dangerous window straighten and lean into the light. I walked out into the ionized air, listened to the prairie grasses whisper, yes, yes, you are changed. And I think I could read those last two lines, <laughs> listening to the prairie grasses whisper, Yes, yes, you are changed. There, there, um, and, and some people might ask, well, which did you intend? And the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like she was reading your diary. <laughs> right? You're like, wait a second. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Yeah. That was great. Oh, wait, I'm so humbled and honored by your response to my painting. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, Connie says your clarity and expressing yourself is so helpful. From Davis, actually. Davis said that. Davis, my man. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Well, you're um, in, the, in the spirit of not being Mr. Pollyanna, optimism, <laughs> all this kind of like, woohoo, everything's going to be great. But with this also fierce commitment that you have to take action every day, to live well, that is the behavior of an optimist. Uh, that is something that our people in our community look at you and admire you for. And um, I'm grateful that our community gets to know you and gets to be around you and gets to see what you do. Uh, what is something that you wish that everybody uh, newly diagnosed with Parkinson's, what do you wish you knew that you knew back then? No. Wow. I'm glad I didn't. I think, I'm, I think I'd have to say I'm glad I didn't know more than I, too much more than I did. It's I was really, thinking like, he's going to say the no, no, the no, I don't know mindset. Like, hey, whatever you know, it is. I mean, like, looking back, honestly, I know uh, learning all you can. I mean, I you can't go wrong learning all you can. And, and as soon as you can, denial just is like a short term strategy that is really helpful by some time. But eventually it's it's just deadly. That's all there is to it. And I but I knew that. What I guess I what I guess I'm I'm glad I didn't know was truly how hard it would be and how devastating it would be for not just me, because Parkinson's is not something that just happens to me. It happens to my family and friend. It redefined my life. People, I hear people say all the time, "I'm not going to let Parkinson's define me." I'm like, okay, well, you go. Good luck with that. I, it sure has defined a lot. It sure has defined me and it's been one of the ways I am defined and it has it has in certain ways uh, uh, directed my life um, in the same way that a hurricane um, changed the life of a friend a poet friend of mine in Florida recently and she had to give up her her home and move into basically a, a converted hospital room and give up all her things um, and uh, in her 80s. Um, that's rough, man. The, one of the early on, I read I, another poem that's on the website is uh, Parkinson's is no gift, Jim. Parkinson's is no gift. I get if, if it was, I'd give it back in a heart, take it back. Um, you know, Amazon takes all kinds of stuff back. I'd give it back in a heartbeat, heartbeat. 
because my life had lots of rich things before Parkinson's. And I'm sure without Parkinson's, I would still have had a rich, wonderful life. But there are, of course, that's not to say there aren't incredible um, gifts along uh, with Parkinson's. I mean, Parkinson's still, I'm still alive. I still have a life. So my life is full of gifts and wonderful things, but it's really, really hard. I had no idea. And I'm glad I didn't because that would have scared the bejesus out of me. And I was already pretty scared. Yeah. I don't know. That's probably a weird answer, but no, no, it's I honest. Right. Yeah. And I mean, just the idea of your don't know mind uh, is that like the time is going to have to go by. And anyway. <laughs> let's say you, you experience something and you're saying, oh, gosh, I got to I'm freaking out. This is something I, I heard this. Somebody said this and they said this is going to happen. I can't get in to see my doctor for two months or three months. That time is going to go by anyway. Exactly. Right. So right. you can either choose to spin, which, hey, human, like no, totally. no shame about it. Um, or you can just kind of wake up every day and say like, oh, thanks, but not I can't deal with you today. I'm not I'm yep. not doing that today. I've got more important <laughs> things in front of me. Right. That's right. Yeah, it's that's totally true, and uh, I just amen, <laughs> just amen. And in, in the meantime, yeah, you're still here. So what the hell are you going to do with that? And some days the answer to that is nothing, but it doesn't have to be that every day. Right. Um, that's called depression, and and um, there are play, and and there are ways that um, you can. Uh, that depression can be uh, opened up um, as well. So, yeah. I, Absolutely. Manisha says, from your poetry, you look standing steady against the Parkinson storm, yourself becoming a solid rock. Anyway, you said you never had tremors. <laughs> Carol says, as always, Wayne, I am grateful to know you. You are always very real, honest, and sometimes so raw in your expression of your gifts and challenges. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Carol. Thanks. Uh, cool. I put this link up. It's on the screen, but it's also in the chat. If you guys want to copy it, this is where you can find uh, Wayne's poetry. Um, yep, yeah, there's Sacred Chill right there. Shameless um, self-promotion. That's fine. And we also have, actually, let me pull this thing up because um, we have a whole page devoted to Wayne. Yes. Um, I'll find it. Everybody can see it. You know, I'm just, I'm still brooding, or not brooding, uh, um, thinking over your last question. And I, and I do want to say that I think I would have benefited from being connected sooner to the, the broader far Parkinson's community or to some community. Um, dance was really, really, really helpful. Um, and that's when people, at, when people are newly diagnosed, recently diagnosed, ask me, that's the, what, that's the one thing I emphasize first and foremost, and then is movement, moving, but right. yeah, connect, get connected. Yeah. Um, I just put up the other one that says uh, davisfinney.org, Wayne Gilbert Poetry. If you want to see Wayne perform a lot of poetry, you can go to that page. There's a lot of videos of him uh, sharing his work. It's really great. For which I am in, internally grateful to the foundation for supporting my work in that way. Oh, yeah, we love it. Um, thank you to Connie, who I think is watching, that um, was uh, talking about this idea. And we are very excited uh, to share it. Watching from Ottawa, Ontario, really enjoying the insights, vulnerabilities, clarity of truth and honesty. Wayne, love your poetry. Love your poetry, Wayne, from Audrey. Thank you, Wayne, for being here. You Lovely. made it with maybe one or two coughs, which is incredible. Uh, maybe you're just supposed to be on camera for the next several days and you won't cough. That's the ticket. Like we should have figured this out weeks ago. Let's do a, let's do a marathon. That would really help me, Mel. Right? You on I the other hand. Oh, well, I did. Um, please, please take care of yourself too, will you? Oh, yeah. Well, All right. It was a joy as always, Wayne. Thank you so Indeed. much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.